Allow me to begin by saying thank you uh, to the Fellowship of Free Thought Dallas for hosting this sort of online virtual presentation. I would have given this speech normally, and I was scheduled to, to give it in person in uh, Dallas, Texas. And of course, because of the COVID-19 situation and the fact that public gatherings have become very problematic, I'm doing this speech here online to be broadcast first to FOF, and then after that, to the rest of the online community. It's a conversation I've been having a lot recently, the conversation about the United States as a Christian nation. This is a claim that we hear so often from uh, even casual Christians. I was going to say the theocrats, the Christian nationalists, but even the casual Christian will say when pressed, well, of course, we're a Christian nation. We are founded on Judeo-Christian principles. We hear that term used quite a bit. Sean Hannity at Fox News and Todd Starnes at Fox News. And I've been talking a lot about the Fox Newsers because of my new book, which deals with the theocrats, the Christian nationalism, and sort of the right-wingism in relation to a specific religion, Christianity. The book is called Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian. And I get into the origins of Fox News, where it came from, the power players behind it. We get into Ronald Reagan, the Reagan years, the Reagan revolution, and his ties to the moral majority and Phyllis Schlafly and these sort of uh, activist theocrats who were dancing over the state church line into politics and the effect that has today. We get into right-wing radio. We get into the gun culture, the abortion debate. And uh, chapter four deals with the Pledge of Allegiance. The chapter is called A Pledge of Allegiance, Loyalty Oaths and the Freedom of Speech. And, you know, we get into where did the pledge come from and why under God wasn't originally part of the pledge and the fact that it was written actually by a socialist, a Christian socialist, and had these sort of Nazi-esque actions that you were supposed to perform with it that had to be replaced during the Second World War for obvious reasons. And we get into the idea of the United States under God, one nation under God, on the money, in God we trust, which constitute many of the arguments that we hear and see from the Christian nationalists. Well, of course, God's in the pledge. God's on the money. Thomas Jefferson. This is somebody who's often embraced by the theocrats as an obvious believer in the God-man Jesus Christ. And we in the atheist movement or the secular movement, the church-state separation movement, talk about his letter to the Danbury Baptist. And we'll throw a quote out from that letter. But where did it come from? Who are the Danbury Baptists? Wait a minute, let's get some context and find out exactly what he was talking about so that we can have that information in our discussions. The Danbury Baptists were a smaller group of believers. Whenever Thomas Jefferson was elected as president in 1801, the Danbury Baptists were nervous. They were nervous that the larger group of Congregationalists, the larger denomination of Congregationalists, were essentially going to sort of bigfoot them out of the equation, right? The larger tribe was going to marginalize the smaller tribe, which is the fear of minorities everywhere we look, right? Wait a minute, those in power are going to push us away from the table and and they're not going to allow us a seat. And so they wrote this impassioned letter to Thomas Jefferson. The Danbury Baptist said this, our sentiments are uniformly on the side of religious liberty, that religion is at all times and places a matter between God and individuals. So essentially they're petitioning Thomas Jefferson Don't let us be kicked out of the party because we are not a majority denomination. Thomas Jefferson, as president, wrote a return letter, a famous letter to the Danbury Baptist, where he said these words. He said, Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people, 
which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Thomas Jefferson actually used those words in his letter to the Danbury Baptist, invoking that wall of separation. Right? They realized when they set up the United States, they wanted the American experiment to be protective of religious liberties, individual rights to practice a religion, to believe whatever you want. But they also knew that government was not a church. The government was not a church. And as I see the uh, theocrats constantly talking about the faith of Thomas Jefferson, the faith in Jesus Christ as God, I am curious if they are aware of the famous Jefferson Bible. Thomas Jefferson sliced out all of the supernatural events and Jesus' miracles, including Jesus' resurrection, and he sliced them out of the Christian Bible. Imagine this sacrilege if a governmental leader, certainly a president, had taken the Bible, God's perfect word. And if you look at the major Christian denominations in this country, the Assemblies of God, the Southern Baptist Convention, and you look at their mission statements, they say outright, overtly, that the Bible is perfect, right? divinely breathed from the mouth of God into the ears and the writing hands of human beings. It is without error. In fact, I think many of the mission statements of the popular Christian denominations actually say it is without error. So here we have Thomas Jefferson going in and just slicing out the supernatural portions of the Bible relating to Jesus and Jesus' resurrection. And you can see this Bible. It is on display today at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. There's a famous letter written by Thomas Jefferson in July of 1819, where he actually admitted, you know, when it comes to religion, what is my personal faith? He said, I am of a sect by myself, as far as I know. He wrote a letter to uh, John Adams on August the 15th of 1820, where he famously said, When once we quit the basis of sensation, all is in the wind. To talk of immaterial existences is to talk of nothings. To say that the human soul, angels, God, are immaterial is to say they are nothings, or that there is no God, no angels, no soul. I cannot reason otherwise, but I believe I'm supported in my creed of materialism by the Locks, the Tracys, and the Stuarts. We talk a lot about this document. It's called the Treaty of Tripoli. The Treaty of Tripoli was essentially a document assuring the nation of Tripoli, which is now modern-day Libya, a, an overwhelming Muslim nation. And uh, we were sort of doing our own thing. We had shipping lanes in the area. We had previously enjoyed the protection of Britain against piracy. But now that we were independent of Britain, we were kind of doing our own thing, setting up those relationships on our own. And Tripoli was nervous, right? A largely Muslim nation was nervous that we were going to try to come in and occupy and convert the whole nation to Christianity, which is something they had seen done in the past. And so the United States, because we were using the shipping lanes in that region and needed the ally, decided to reassure Tripoli that, no, our purpose is not to colonize you, not to convert you, not to come in and try to inject whatever we're doing into what you're doing. We want to assure you we just want to use the shipping lanes. And so the Treaty of Tripoli is the document that said so. And there's this famous paragraph which says, As the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, as it has in itself no character of enmity against the laws, religion, or tranquility of, and this means Muslim, as the said states never entered into any war or act of hostility against any Muslim nation, it is declared by the parties that no pretext arising from religious opinions shall ever produce an interruption of the harmony existing between the two countries. This Treaty of Tripoli 
penned back in 1797, signed by none other than John Adams himself. Mention John Adams to a casual Christian or even, you know, a theocrat evangelical pastor type, and they will say, well, John Adams was a man of great faith. John Adams was a Christian, yet John Adams had signed his name to a document saying, we are not a Christian nation. Can't be any clearer than that. James Madison opposed a bill that was proposed back in 1785, which would have used taxpayer money to fund Christian classes in public school, right? Taxpayer money, promoting a specific religion. And James Madison strongly and publicly opposed this. He called it a dangerous abuse of power because religion or the duty which we owe to our Creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. You can't push this stuff on our school kids, and that is not the purpose of school anyway. Now, notice he did invoke the Creator, which a lot of the Founding Fathers did. But as with Jefferson and uh, potentially Benjamin Franklin and some others, they were invoking a deistic god, not a specific deity with a proper name representing a specific religion. And some of this was just simply part of the etiquette and the vernacular of the day. They invoked a creator. I think they mentioned God in the Declaration of Independence, or the creator, rather, in their declaration. But they purposefully did not include any mention of God, not one, in the United States Constitution. We're going to get to the Constitution in just a moment. Thomas Paine, much like Thomas Jefferson, likely a deist, he wrote The Age of Reason, a series of pamphlets that he published from 1794 to 1807. Thomas Paine strongly attacked the institution of the church, strongly attacked organized religion. In The Age of Reason, he said this, The study of theology as it stands in Christian churches is the study of nothing. It is founded on nothing. It rests on no principles, it proceeds by no authorities, it has no data, it can demonstrate nothing, and it admits of no conclusion. Benjamin Franklin, he may have believed in Jesus, but there's no evidence he believed in the God-man Jesus, the supernatural version of Jesus. He actually wrote parodies about Puritan intolerance, you know, these sort of dogmatic Puritans who were foisting their religion on everybody else. And he is on record actually saying that he had some doubts to Jesus Christ's divinity. He was also more interested in sort of humanism, human behavior, human goodness. He said publicly, I think vital religion has always suffered when orthodoxy is more regarded than virtue. Wouldn't it be refreshing if we saw this kind of language from the theocrats in power today, more interested in human virtue, goodness, actions that are good for their own sake, instead of assigning this sort of Christian narrative to all acts of goodness, trying to co-opt all acts of goodness for a specific religion, promoting a specific God for specific reasons, saying that this nation belongs to a specific faith. Of course, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution disagrees with that. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The United States was never designed to be a church. It does protect an individual right to believe and practice your faith or non-faith, but it is not a Christian nation. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. One of the most popular arguments among casual Christianity today is the fact that we see in God we trust on our currency. Right? It's God on the money, of course. This nation belongs to God. 
Even a cursory look into the history of our national motto reveals that In God We Trust was not the original motto of the United States. It was E Pluribus Unum, which means out of many, one. But there was a religious resurgence right after the Civil War. Remember a time of tremendous tragedy, over 600,000 American lives lost in that war. And there was a spike in religiosity, and they added in God we trust to coinage right after the Civil War. In the mid-20th century, we saw devout Christian, Presbyterian Christian, Dwight Eisenhower, who was infusing his specific religious belief into his office and into the language of the United States. This was against the backdrop of the Cold War. We saw godless communism, right? Those evil Soviets used to worship the state, the rights of the individual, which are God-ordained, stripped away from them. So to position the United States as morally superior, as righteous, as God's country against godless communism, we began using God, sort of weaponizing this invocation of God. And we did so by including it on our paper currency as mandated in the mid-1950s and also including under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. These words did not exist when the pledge was first created, first written by Francis Bellamy back in the late 1800s. Francis Bellamy wrote the Pledge of Allegiance in 1892 for a publication called The Youth's Companion. It was commemorating the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus landing in the New World. And so he wrote this pledge And it was shared and shared, and it caught fire and became part of the national consciousness and adopted as the Pledge of Allegiance. But his original pledge didn't have the words under God in them. Now, it was many decades later when the words under God were added, almost 200 years after the founding of the United States. This language was not the intent of our founding fathers who established a state church-separated secular government on a secular constitution. There are other examples, but run any of this stuff by the theocrats who are currently waltzing in and out of the White House and enjoying time in the spotlight. People like this man, Pastor Robert Jeffress. Dr. Jeffress is pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. He is also on Donald Trump's Evangelical Advisory Board. Why? Does a state church-separated government have an evangelical advisory board? This is an important question. Dr. Jeffress gave a sermon back in 2018. It was publicized and advertised on billboards. and It was broadcast online across the nation. The sermon called, America is a Christian Nation, where Dr. Robert Jeffress said things like this. America was not founded as a nation that is neutral toward Christianity. America was founded as a Christian nation. Dr. Jeffress was selling the narrative that we belong to a specific religion, the Christian religion. He invoked Thomas Jefferson during his sermon, saying, and this is slippery, he said that Thomas Jefferson did not support a governmental religion, but he did support a governmental faith. I'm not sure what the difference is. And of course, what specific faith is Dr. Jeffress talking about? It's not Islam. Certainly it is his specific religion, Christianity. Paula White, she is an evangelist. She serves on Donald Trump's Evangelical Advisory Board, has a lot of access to Trump and the Republican Party and the White House and the halls of the United States government. She gave this invocation And join our nation to your purpose. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The psalmist declared, let your favor be upon this one nation under God. Let these United States of America be that beacon of hope to all people and nations under your dominion. A true hope for humankind. The religious language continues. Among those in this administration, Energy Secretary Rick Perry called Donald Trump the chosen one. He said he believed that Donald Trump was sent by God to do, quote, 
great things. Rick Perry doesn't see a representative government doing the will of the people. He believes that government and its leader or leaders are actually here to support a specific religion, to do God's good work. At the inauguration I mentioned just a few minutes ago, evangelist Franklin Graham came forward to the podium. He believed that even the weather affirmed God's choosing of Donald Trump to be President of the United States. Mr. President, in the Bible, rain is a sign of God's blessing. And it started to rain, Mr. President, when you came to the platform. Now, what's more likely, that God used the weather to affirm the presidency of Donald Trump, or that it rains nine out of 30 days in Washington, D.C. in January. I'm just saying. But we see the theocrats continuing their tap dance over the state church line. People like this guy, Dallas mega pastor John Hagee. He declares we are a Christian nation. Hagee's a Christian Zionist. He believes the establishment of the Israeli state, the Jewish state, is actually part of a biblical narrative, which is a precursor to the return of Jesus Christ and the end times. Essentially, this is part of an end-of-the-world narrative. And this was affirmed by Mike Pompeo, United States Secretary of State. Pompeo did an interview last year on CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network. That's very telling, right? He's on the Christian Broadcasting Network doing an interview, a friendly interview with a host who asked the question if maybe Trump was being used like the biblical Queen Esther was used by God to help establish the Jews, to protect God's people. And Pompeo responded, yeah, he thinks that's highly possible. Trump had recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel John Hagee and Robert Jeffress went over to Israel and gave a prayer as Jerusalem was acknowledged as the capital of Israel. This is bizarre because Jeffress is on record essentially saying that Jews are not going to go to heaven because the Jews don't believe in a literal Jesus Christ. Why would Robert Jeffress go to Israel and lead a prayer for those people he believes are going straight to hell? Well, I believe it's about power. I believe it's about power and influence and control and Christian dominionism. I'm going to show you a resource in just a few minutes which goes a lot deeper into this particular subject. Our Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, has said that education reform can, in her words, advance God's kingdom. Attorney General William Barr gave a speech recently at the National Association of Religious Broadcasters. He complained about militant secularists who were attacking religious freedom. We say that religion is a private exercise, not a governmental exercise. People like William Barr say it's an attack on our religious freedom. We say that there's no place for a Ten Commandments monument on state capitol grounds in Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, and elsewhere. And people like Barr say, you're attacking our religious freedom. We say we should return to the original motto of the United States, E Pluribus Unum, out of many one, instead of a religious motto. And the Christian nationalists cry, religious persecution, you're attacking my religious freedom expressed concerns about Project Blitz, which brought 75 bills in more than 20 states in 2017 and 2018, bills which promote the privilege of a specific single religion, Christianity. They won Bibles and Christian prayers in public schools, religious excuses to discriminate against non-Christians, gays, Muslims, etc., biblically informed prohibitions on female reproductive choice, and the embedding of a specific and single religion into a nation that is supposed to separate the church and the state while representing people of all faiths and none. We are seeing right now a United States government which is a betrayal to the very notions, principles, and ideals of the founding fathers of the United States. It is a government that is acting like a church, giving favoritism to a specific religion 
when it should be acting constitutionally on behalf of all American citizens. Now, here's the good news. In the United States, we are seeing a decline of religiosity. Metric after metric, statistic after statistic, we are seeing people who are not going to church as much. They are certainly not as dogmatic as their parents and their grandparents and their parents. We're seeing people who aren't interested in discriminating against their fellow human beings who might be different or think differently. You know, they don't want to deny service or human rights or the right to marry, etc., to LGBT people. They don't discriminate against someone who might hold to a different faith or none. They might be less inclined to identify as a specific religious faith, and perhaps they hold to more of a deistic opinion. You know, I think there's a God out there somewhere, but I'm not involving myself in the activities of a specific church. I'm not necessarily getting what I need as a human being from the church. I'm not saying there are necessarily more and more atheists, like we're not seeing 30 plus percent of Americans being atheists. That's not statistically true. But the rise of the nuns, the non-religious, you know what? I may be spiritual, but I'm not religious. Those numbers are hugely on the rise in this country. And it's my hope that we will see one day soon those who represent them in the halls of power reflecting that lack of religiosity. And I think this explains the mad dash, the power grab, the scramble by the theocrats, by the Christian nationalists who see the writing on the wall. They see the rise of the nuns. They see that their stranglehold on power, their monopoly is fast going away. It is certainly under extreme and eminent threat. And so they are trying to stack the courts. They are trying to change the laws. They are trying to entrench and embed themselves into the halls of power. And they are screaming more and more about the fact that they are finally being held accountable and being told that they must share the table with you and me, which is what the Constitution required in the first place. Catherine Stewart has a great new book out called The Power Worshippers Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. Catherine takes the position that many of the people who are promoting Christian nationalism may not necessarily be interested in Christianity as much as they are in power, right? You do whatever you can to maintain power. The famous quote, By George Orwell, we know that no one ever seizes power with the intention of relinquishing it. And there's a lot of truth to that. What is the famous saying? When you're in a position of privilege, equality feels like oppression. We're seeing people who have long enjoyed a position of privilege, and now they're being told that no, they don't get preferential treatment, and they are losing their minds. Also, another great book came out last year from constitutional attorney, Andrew Seidel, his book, The Founding Myth, Why Christian Nationalism is Un-American. I've had Andrew Seidel on my broadcast on several occasions to talk about the intent of the founding fathers, the founding documents, the framework of the United States, and why all of this theocratic overreach is actually not American. Christian nationalism is un-American. Andrew Seidel had a beautiful tweet I had to screen capture because it just sort of summed everything up. He said, Dear white evangelicals, we're not coming for your rights. We're coming for your privilege. You'll be able to worship as you see fit so long as you don't use government power to promote your religion or use your religion to violate another's rights. And that's the whole point of this. Right? We don't want to persecute religious people. We want to tell them that you don't get to live in a world where you have more power and influence than the rest of us, and you don't live in a bubble where you are never contradicted or disagreed with. What's that quote by Emerson? Let me never fall into the mistake of dreaming I am persecuted whenever I am contradicted. We're not persecuting religious people. We're just raising the hand of disagreement and saying, I disagree. Your facts are wrong. I take a different position. When it comes to those who seek to violate the Constitution, who seek to twist the words and intentions of our founding fathers and to entrench themselves as theocrats 
in the halls of power so they can better exclude other people. We simply say, we are not coming for your rights, but we are coming for your privilege. Because the very idea of a theocracy, the very idea of God and country, the very idea of a Christian nation is in fact un-American. Thank you so much for watching.